I am saying these things to those who absent themselves from the sacred meetings and to those who busy themselves with everyday matters and idle gossip at the time of the awesome mysteries of the Lord's table. What do you think you are doing, my friend? Did you not make a promise to the priest who said, Let us lift up our mind and our hearts, when you responded, We lift them up to the Lord? Do you not fear? Do you not blush when you are shown up to be a liar at this sacred awesome hour? Is it not a wonderful and amazing thing? The sacred table is ready. The Lamb of God is being slain for you. The priest is giving his all for you. The spiritual fire is blazing forth from the holy table. The cherubim are standing by. The seraphim are hovering. The six-winged spirits have their faces covered. All the spiritual powers are praying for you along with the priest. The spiritual fire is descending. The blood in the chalice is being poured from Christ's immaculate side for your cleansing. Do you not fear? Do you not blush when you are shown up to be a liar at the sacred awesome hour? There are 168 hours in the week and God has set aside just one for himself. Do you waste this in worldly business? in ridiculous things and everyday affairs? And then with what boldness do you draw near to the mysteries? What kind of polluted conscience do you have when you do this? If you have a foul muck on your hands, would you be brazen enough to even touch the hem of an earthly ruler? Never. Do not look on what is before you as simply bread and do not consider it merely as wine. It does not pass through you and end up in the drain like other foods. You have got to think differently. Wax mingled with the flame does not lose its essence. Nothing eventually remains of it. In a similar way, consider that the holy mysteries are taken up into that very essence of the body. So when you draw near, don't think that you are receiving the holy body from a man. No. Consider that you are receiving the divine body as though from the seraphim with tongues of fire, such as Isaiah saw. Let us consider, too, that we are touching God's immaculate side with our lips as we share in the saving blood. So, brothers, let us not be absent from our churches, and let us not continue to busy ourselves with the affairs of daily life. Let us stand in fear and trembling, with our eyes lowered, and our soul raised up. With hushed sighs, let us cry aloud in our heart. People standing before a visible, mortal, and temporary earthly ruler are motionless, silent, not shifting to and fro, not moving their eyes one way or another. Isn't that what you see? They look solemn, awestruck with their eyes lowered, stand accused by them. So I appeal to you to stand before God in that attitude as though you were coming into the presence of an earthly ruler. All the more, of course, you should stand before the heavenly king in fear. I will not stop speaking regularly to you like this until I see that you change your ways. When we come into church, let us come in a way fitting for God, not bearing grudges in our heart, lest praying we pray against ourselves when we say, forgive us as we forgive those who are in debt to us. It is a fearful utterance. One might say that the people are crying out to God when they say, I have forgiven, Master, forgive me. I have released someone, release me. I have been merciful, be merciful to me. If I have been overbearing with somebody, then be overbearing with me. If I have not forgiven my neighbors their sins, then don't forgive mine. Whatever measure I have given to others, let it be given to me. Keep all that in mind. Think about that fearful day and that fire and the fearful places of torment. So let us in future turn our backs on the errors of our ways. For the time will come when the stage of this world will be destroyed. After that, the struggle of life will be over. When we have departed from the stage of this life, there will be no more business. There will be no more worldly crowns of honor. Now is the time for repentance, then will be the time for judgment. This is the time for contests, then will be the time for crowns. This is the time for labor, then for rest. This is the time for weary toil, 
then for reward. Wake up, I implore you, wake up. Let us listen eagerly to what is being said. We have lived in the flesh, let us now live in the spirit. We have lived for pleasure, let us now live for virtue. We have lived without due care, let us now have a change of heart. Where is the pride in earth and ash? Why are you full of conceit, my friend? Why do you boast about yourself? What can you hope for, for the glory and the wealth of the world? I suggest that we go out to the tombs and to see the mysteries there. Let us see nature torn apart, bones eaten away, bodies decomposing. If you are wise, take a moment to think about it. And if you are prudent, tell me who there is a ruler and who a common person. Who is well-born and who a slave? Who is wise and who is foolish? Where is the beauty of youth? Where is the attractive appearance? Where are the sparkling eyes? Where is the perfectly shaped nose? Where are the lips that set you on fire? Where are the beautiful cheeks? Where is the glowing forehead? Is not everything dust? Has not everything been reduced to ashes? Is not everything worms and the foul smell of decay? Think on these things, my friends, and the final day of our earthly life. While we have time, let us turn to the error, turn from the error of our ways. We have been bought with precious blood. For this very purpose, God was made manifest on earth. It was for you, my friend, that God was made manifest on earth. With nowhere to rest his head, can you believe it? The judge comes to the judgment for the sake of the condemned. Life tastes death. The creator is flogged by his creation. The one who cannot be looked upon by even seraphim is spat upon by a slave. He tastes the vinegar and the gall. He is pierced by a spear. He is laid in the tomb. Tell me, is it nothing to you, my friend? Do you sleep and take it all lightly? Do you not realize that even if you were to pour out your own blood for him, that you would come nowhere close to what is needed? His blood is royal. Yours is that of a slave. Anticipate through repentance and conversion the exit of your soul from this earthly life, lest when death comes, the medicine of repentance is utterly to no avail. Repentance has effect in our earthly life. In Hades alone, it is powerless. Let us seek the Lord while we have time. Let us do the good things so that we can be delivered from the unending place of torment which is to come and be found worthy of the kingdom of heaven through the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen.